speak with you today. Before going on the bench, Judge Kennedy was both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, practiced, uh, in, it was in private practice for a number of years. He served for 11 years as a judge of the trial court level in New Mexico, where he handled over 60,000 civil and criminal cases. He was appointed to the New Mexico Court of Appeals in 1999 and served for 17 years, including three as the chief judge of that court. He is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in forensic science and the law. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. He's the winner of the J.B. Firth Memorial Lecture Medal from the Forensic Science Society in the United Kingdom. He's published in peer-reviewed journals on forensic science issues and is a contributor to the leading treatise on forensic science. And so we're very delighted to have him with us here today to talk about uh, forensic science and the law in which he is an internationally and nationally known expert. Judge Kennedy, thank you. Thank you, Dean. There we go. Um, that's kind of fun. I think I'm not. I'm going to be talking about a few other things besides um, forensic science. Um, you know, some some people may say, "Well, geez, you know, here's a guy who uh, who left Toledo, went out to New Mexico, and and hasn't been back for 36 years." Well, I have occasionally. Um, what you know, what what's going on here? I am a little bit bemused myself. Um, I know the person who, who put me up for this award, and when I called him, um, because, you know, in the criminal law, snitches have problems, and I wanted to make sure he would have them too, he said, actually, Rod, um, I put you up because for, you know, what you are and who you are, um, you represent the greatest number of existential miles traveled, and you need an award for that. Um, and I will say, now that I've had a, one heck of a rich life, um, and I'll talk about some of that, um, and, I, and I'm truly grateful for it, and it started here in Toledo. Um, but I'm going to be, you know, giving a little bit of, a little bit of personal stuff and talking a little bit about, um, about some problems that I've been thinking about lately in terms of, uh, in terms of forensic science uh, and, and criminal court and how it's frequently different than how science is handled in civil courts and the role of mythology when it comes into criminal courts um, and, uh, and how we look at it there. Um, uh, first off, I want to thank Dean Barros uh, for the introduction. I want to thank the, the University of Toledo College of Law for giving me one heck of a legal, legal education. Um, when I got to New Mexico, I found out that I had been extremely well educated um, by the University of Toledo. Um, in some ways, um, well, I, I'm, uh, I've been fond of telling the dean of UNM's law school, you've got a great law school here, dean, but it's no Toledo. Um, and there are some things that, that are done here that are just incredible. The clinical program, for instance, uh, I was a juvenile prosecutor in the clinical program, and that was absolutely nuts. I was a juvenile prosecutor, probably did 50 or 60 trials. When I went out to New Mexico, the DA hiring me said, how many trials have you done? I said, 50. He said, baloney, more or less. And, uh, and I said, here's the phone number in Toledo, call the guy. And he called me back and he said, you got a job. Um, and started me off on my career of wreaking terror through New Mexico. Um, so, um, thanks to the people from, uh, from the University of Toledo, um, to be here as a, as a distinguished alumnus is really something. Um, it's nothing I ever saw for myself. Um, I was probably a fairly mediocre student. You may hear more about that later. Um, and it's, but it's really humbling to receive an honor um, primarily for, for doing things and continuing to do things that I, that I really love to do. Um, the other thing I want to do is I want to thank Heather Carnes who has kind of put this trip together for me, and um, she is really, really super, and uh, works hard, and you, you folks really have a gem here. Um, I was born, adopted, and raised here in Toledo, Ohio. My dad worked for the Blade. My mom was a former teacher, a homemaker. Um, dad admired lawyers. He always wanted to be one, didn't quite do it. He was one of those guys, um, which means that he had no idea what being a lawyer was about. Um, I remember his telling the name 
lawyer in a big firm here in Toledo once, or in front of me, was telling me if I worked hard, um, I could get into a firm like that particular one. Um, and, uh, and this big firm lawyer who knew me um, at that time said, you know, I think I need a cigarette. Come on out in the backyard, Rod, and, you know, it was a dinner party. And, and he said, don't ever. I know who you are. You want to do trials. You want to, you know, you want to kick butt and take names. Do not ever join a big firm. Just don't do it. Um, plus, you'll never get to play golf for 10 years, and your dad doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, my mother was the daughter and granddaughter of prominent lawyers out of Adrian, Michigan. Um, and uh, she knew what lawyers were about. Uh, my grandfather, I guess, was not a pleasant guy, but he was a pretty legendary lawyer. But I, somehow I got the bug. Atticus Finch probably figured that in, too, when I read uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, but I can't remember a time when I didn't think about being a lawyer. I just can't. I thought about being a doctor, and then I took science classes. How many, to how many people in this room did that happen? Science, science drove us into the law. Um, okay. Um, but I, you know, the, uh, and I still want to be a lawyer when I grow up. Um, anyway, when I was in, in college, my dad and I walked through the courthouse. I remember we were, went had, he worked down at the Blade. We were out having lunch. And somehow we wound up in the, on the floor where there's all those doors with the glass windows and the judges' names and gold leaf on them. And, and my dad was saying, you know, if you study real hard, it was always a, a theme with him, if you study real hard, you can succeed. Um, and, uh, and maybe someday you can go to law school and you can be um, a, a clerk for a, you know, for a judge like these guys here, um, like Tom Pletz. And Tom's sitting over there. And I like it, you know, I, gotta, I always try to embarrass somebody in a speech. Um, but, uh, and Tom's a great lawyer, um, and, uh, I think my dad probably thought, and, you know, and maybe if you shape up, you might actually be a judge, um, but, uh, he saw me, uh, he saw me pass the bar, he saw me as a prosecutor, he died shortly after that, um, but my mom got to see me sworn in on the New, Me New Mexico Court of Appeals in 1999, um, but it sure was not a straight journey, um, the, um, and this is a picture of my parents and me. Um, this is, uh, as a matter of fact, um, it's a mine in New Mexico um, that had been in the family since about 1919. Uh, not particularly productive, but when my parents died, this is the shaft they gave me. <laughs> okay. So, but lots of things had to come together to be, you know, to be this uh, Titanic guy standing in front of you. Um, I had great science teachers at St. John's High School. If anybody here went to St. John's and remember Sweeney and Lotze um, for chemistry and biology, respectfully, they were great. Um, the, uh, they taught how science worked, what the scientific method was, how you analyze, uh, how you analyze data, how there are rules for looking at, at things in the scientific method, and how those rules are standardized so everybody plays by the same ones. Um, all right. My parents had lived in Arizona, so trips to the Southwest were frequent. In 1975, I was a ranger at the National Scout Ranch in northern New Mexico up in the mountains. Spent the summer there, uh, tra you know, traipsing through the mountains. Um, when I was done there, I spent a fall internship on the Navajo Reservation as an intern at DNA Legal Services in Window Rock, Arizona. Um, DNA has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with nucleic acids. Um, it stands for which is lawyers contributing to the economic revitalization of the Navajo people. Um, either you know, Navajo or English, it's still a pretty long title. Um, but there, my boss, um, I was in the community education department as a graphic artist and writer, but my boss frequently talked about a Navajo attorney, Louis Denitsosi, as a guy who was a total ace with a huge grasp of evidence law and taught me that evidence law was something that was really important, particularly if I wanted to do trials. Um, so another seed got planted. Um, I got into law school um, here at TU. Um, I will always call it TU, I'm sorry. Um, at the fall of 1977, uh, Professor Jim Carr, who later went on to become a judge, um, when he told me that I had gotten in, because he found out before I did, we were neighbors, and we were painting his house, and he said, I got good news and bad news. The good news is you just got into law school. The bad news is you're in night school, and you're already on academic probation. <laughs> Story of my life. Um, anyway, but I took evidence uh, from the incredibly talented Tony Morano, 
Oh, this is kind of the, not too far from where I live. Um, from Tony Morano. And in those days, evidence was a common law thing. The rules of evidence had just been adopted in 1975 and weren't in common use, uh, particularly. And we took common law evidence um, and then alongside of that uh, learned the federal rules of evidence. And that was kind of a, and that turned out to be a valuable thing as, as I went on. Um, professors uh, Roger Anderson and, and Vince Nathan beat the living tar out of me. Um, but actually, I did okay with those guys. Um, and uh, then in 1975, John Vance, who was the former chair of the Indian Claims Commission, became a professor here. And sort of, uh, I took him on as a mentor. This is a picture of John, who was one of the greatest people in the world. Um, as far as I'm concerned, he, uh, uh, he probably had one of the best pieces of advice that has ever been given to a young lawyer. He said, well, what do you do? You just do what you can, and sometimes you take a terrible beating. Thanks, John. He also said that the great thing about appellate judges is they could have said something else, but they didn't. And I learned that that is really true in my later life. Um, here he is with a fellow by the name of Dennis Chapabitty, who is a Comanche Apache lawyer out of uh, Oklahoma, now, uh, now out of California. Um, and we'll talk more about Dennis later. Um, but this is John Vance. Uh, he went back to Washington when he was done here, uh, was counsel for the Indian Affairs Commission uh, Committee on the Senate, and uh, uh, died of Alzheimer's back in, uh, back in the early 2000s. But he was a, a fine gentleman and, and somebody I want to talk about it uh, in a bit. Um, but he got me thinking about doing Indian law when I went back out west, because I intended to. Uh, and then Jerry Moran, who taught tax, was right. Um, you cannot cram for an income tax exam. Um, and don't come in from a sailboat race at 6 a.m. and expect to walk into an exam at 8.30 a.m. and do very well. Um, but I'll tell you that that's, that quarter, even with the F I got from Moran, um, I did raise my average that quarter. Um, um, this is another thing from just about the same place that other one was. Um, the, uh, anyway, uh, I did the juvenile prosecutor's clinic, like I said, and I went to New Mexico about a month after I, I graduated, um, and I passed the bar. And this is me on graduation day from law school with my Aunt Jane and Uncle Bill. Um, still wearing three-piece suits, but there's more, more cloth in them now. Um, I, uh, I got a job in the, in the district attorney's office on the force, on the force of the, T, uh, the prosecutor's clinic. Um, and, uh, you know, I did an awful lot of DWI trials at first, the way, uh, um, you know, the way you do when you're a baby prosecutor. Um, Don Gifford, who taught the prosecutor's clinic here, made the comment to our class um, that everything that you will ever see in trial law is going to be found in a DWI case. Baby prosecutors think that that's you know, just rotten work and not very challenging and whatever. If you do DWI law right, everything you will ever see in a trial, scientific evidence, documentary evidence, you name it, is going to show up in DWI work. Some of the best lawyers I know around the country are DWI lawyers um, who also do you know, more general criminal work. Um, anyway, that was true. Um, with about 7,500 cases in DWI under my belt now, I can say unequivocally. Um, so let's take a dive into some of this, uh, some of this scientific evidence uh, kind of thing. Um, I think there's a pretty big disparity between the way we look at, at scientific evidence in, in civil and criminal cases. Part of it is the nature of the science is different. What you see in civil cases is frequently um, pure science, academic science, things like epidemiology, things that are taught in, you know, um, in science classes and departments. Um, in the criminal law, you have what's called forensic science, which is generally applied science or scientific techniques that were de developed to answer questions in criminal cases. Um, and they were generally developed uh, not in academic laboratories uh, in colleges, but in police laboratories around the country. Yeah, okay. Um, and a lot of times I think that, uh, that criminal judges, or judges, even civil judges sitting in criminal cases, 
um, shirk their obligations under the Daubert case. Show of hands, who's, who's big on the Daubert case? Pletz, of course. <laughs> You're still doing great. <laughs> um, George Corcoran from Wayne State. Um, how, many here, how many folks here have taken evidence law? Did you cover Rule 702 and expert witnesses? Did Daubert come up? Daubert, Joyner, Kumho, the big three. Okay. Um, all right, when I come back next time, we're going to have a test. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, it says that judges have to be, uh, have to be uh, vouchsafe for the quality of evidence, scientific evidence that goes in front of a jury, and there's a way to do that, and that's why I'm going to take it. Uh, you're taking a test is I will have materials here in a moment um, before it's admitted for, for a jury. Um, I want to introduce you to two men uh, that I've met over dinner. Calvin Johnson, and this is why I'm interested in this, served about 17 years in prison, maximum security for a rape that he did not commit based on phony serology evidence um, matching a, an enzyme in, uh, in semen to his blood type and so on, and the expert said it was definitely him beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, 17 years later, DNA said it most certainly was not. DNA also said exactly who it was, which was not Calvin Johnson. Uh, Ron Cotton, who was on the right, um, served 15 years based mostly on eyewitness testimony of a rape victim who over a span of a two-hour assault said she took great care to remember everything about the man who was raping her. He, like Mr. Johnson, was exonerated by DNA. As a matter of fact, while he was in prison, he heard through the grapevine that a man in another cell block was bragging that Ron Cotton was doing the time for a rape that that man had committed. And when, DNA came, when the DNA exonerated Ron, the DNA actually incriminated that guy who was bragging over in the other cell block. So that, uh, that's a total of about 32 years between two people that should not have been spent in prison. Uh, prison is not nice. People die in prison from all sorts of things, including other prisoners. Um, so I want you to take a moment. For those of us who make a commitment to the law, we have to have faith in its abilities to do justice. Um, see yourself for a moment, sitting next to Calvin Johnson or Ron Cotton over dinner. They're both wonderful men. They're both great dinner company. But for those of us in the law, they are there because of the injustices they suffered, and we are sworn to a higher calling in the law than to allow those kind of injustices. How do you feel when you're sitting there? Just think about that. I mean, you're just chatting, having a nice time at dinner, but you know who this person is and why he's there. Because he's, maybe at a, I met uh, Calvin in an Innocence Project thing in Atlanta, and I knew why he was there. Um, you know, how can you talk about an abject failure of every aspiration for the criminal trial process when its impact is asking you, sitting there and asking you to pass the salt? It is otherworldly. We know that out of 350-some DNA exonerations nationwide, more than half were the result of overstated or misleading forensic science testimony. When you leave these gentlemen's company, uh, Ron and, and Calvin, what are you going to do about having that knowledge and having the knowledge that comes from becoming, uh, becoming familiar with these people and now carrying them along with you um, in that memory, because they are the embodiment of the failure that we fear most. And I told Calvin, I, you know, after a few minutes, I said, you know, I don't know, I, I'm just freaking out here because you represent, you, you don't even represent it. You are the failure that I as a judge fear most. That we did, we got it so wrong with crummy evidence that was filled with myth, like the myth is that it worked to identify people, it obviously didn't. And, uh, you know, and I said, I don't know if any judges said that or on behalf of lawyers or whatever, or judges, I, I don't know if I can speak for them, but I'm really sorry. He said, you're the first person who ever said that. Um, I wish the heck I could be, uh, I wish I could be the last. Um, okay, so early lessons. Uh, 20 years after I graduate, I am a, I, like I said, a brilliant young uh, district attorney. Um, 
and I get, a, uh, I get a DWI case. The first guy there is Leon Taylor. He was the flashiest criminal defense lawyer in the state of New Mexico when I started. He was a titan. He would stand up and he would do trials like a Baptist preacher. And he would say, Your Honor, that man is innocent, and that prosecutor is a crook. And I'm like, thanks, Leon. I thought we were friends. <laughs> we are not friends until I'm out of the courtroom. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I had a 0.23 breath test in a case. How many think that a 0.23 is pretty high? You know, the fear of drunk driving is an awful lot more prevalent than the fear of not knowing Daubert in school, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. The, uh, so, I got a point two three. I think I'm doing pretty well. Right? This guy ought to be convinced. Leon brings in a guy with credentials. He's uh, got a PhD in pharmacy. Who testifies that a person is not necessarily impaired, and the defendant particularly would not have necessarily been impaired, with that amount of alcohol in his blood. An expert witness. And I crossed him. And, you know, I hadn't done much. I was still a young lawyer. And I was like, well, you know, where'd you get that? He said, well, I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And, uh, and the judge hauled off and said, <laughs> not guilty. And I was furious. So, like I said, I had some early lessons. Um, it's a, <laughs> you can't, you know, if you're not prepared for an expert witness, that's kind of tough, and it's even tougher to call bullshit on a judge, particularly in court, um, and uh, for believing that that stuff is true. Um, the answer is, and what I did was, I got mad and I educated myself so it would never happen again. All right, 20, you know, about 20 years after that. I'm a municipal judge, and a young prosecutor walks up to me and says, Judge, i got to dismiss this DWI case we got this morning. And I said, why? And she said, well, the, the blood test in the case is just, uh, I can't use it. It was an accident. Um, I can prove that the defendant was driving, but the test is worthless. I said, why? She said, well, it's a 0.1 blood, a 0.51 blood test. Whoa. And I said, well, you know, but that's, you know, that's pretty darn high. How come you can't use it? She said, my supervisor said that everybody's dead at a .40 and this, and this test has to be bad. <laughs> and I said, okay. Um, did you check the evidence? I mean, did you talk to the lab guys and ask them about, you know, alcohol and human bodies? Nope. Because my supervisor said I didn't have to. Well, okay, did you read anything about, you know, alcohol and human beings? Nope. Because my supervisor said, drop the case. I said, all right, sign your notice of dismissal, and we're done for the morning. Well, you know, she was cleaning up a little bit later that day, or that morning, to go back to her office before lunch. I called her up to the bench, and I said, look, would it make you feel any better that, you know, according to my re reading of the literature, um, you know, there have been sentient people walking and talking at a 0.5 and above as high as a 0.78. And she looked a little cross-eyed at me. And I said, um, you know, even the breath test will go up to a 0.45, and there's a reason for that. And, uh, and she looked a little bit more, uh, you know, crazy. And, uh, and I said, look, you know, I don't want to disparage your supervisor, but your supervisor doesn't know what you're talking about. And since they're not teaching you how to be a lawyer, this is a great judge thing, right? <laughs> and this is how you get hated by young lawyers. Um, but say, look, next time you have a bit, a bit of evidence that deals with science, talk to the people who know the science, not your idiot supervisor. And I've worked with your supervisor, and I have some basis for saying what I'm saying. All right. All right, another case, when I got on the Court of Appeals. Um, Case comes in, three judges on the Court of Appeals. Anyway, in this case, a very self-confident police officer who was definitely overtrained, perhaps, um, testified that based on her field sobriety test training, which was written by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administrator, Administration, um, she knew, based on the defendant's performance on those tests, that he was in the, as she said, 95th percentile of being likely to be at the legal limit or above. 
Anybody here done enough st statistics to sniff a problem already? Yeah. We got a problem here with this percentile thing. Okay. So, as a matter of fact, when I mentioned percentile, my apparel, you know, I, I was talking about it in my chambers, my paralegal who was just outside the door, who had two PhDs in nuclear chemistry and used to do verification of nuclear weapons around the world uh, before she retired from her real job in Los Alamos National Labs and came to work because she thought the law was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and now she's clerking for the Chief Justice on the Supreme Court and driving him nuts too. But she, you know, she just yelled out, that's not a percentile. Well, she's right. Um, but, so anyway, my panel said, yes, that is improper testimony. Because she doesn't know what she's talking about. And she's cloaking it in the mantle of science that she has all this training and there's been research done. And, and the research indicates a 95% percentile. Percentile is a great word for not what she's talking about. <laughs> and so the, the Court of Appeals, my panel says, that is improper testimony. Should not have been admitted, and it was error to admit it. But we took a dodge, or they took a dodge. They said, but it's harmless error. <clears throat> now, there are presumptions that say that the trial result needs to be right, and we presume that it is. And an appellant has to show something to overcome that presumption. But this is somebody talking about science in front of a jury in scientific terms. And I didn't see it as harmless error. So I pulled out my 280 batting average on my dissents with our Supreme Court, almost all the same level in my head. Um, and I said, no, this is not harmless error. This is anything but harmless error. This is harmful error, period, because Anybody trying to sound sciencey and cloaking baloney in it um, is, uh, is doing too great a disservice because everybody likes to hear science and they think it's the absolute. The Supreme Court agreed with me. Thank heavens for those guys. Um, and of course, the only real expert opinion we got was my, uh, my paralegal who said, that's crappy statistics. Um, but how did that case come to be? The National High, you know, NHTSA, the <coughs> Highway Traffic Safety Administration, did research, and they basically found that in 90% of the people who were over the limit, those symptoms were seen. That is not something that can establish a predictive value to say it's a 95% chance that those people with that will be over the limit. You know, that is post hoc ergo propter hoc. You, know, you take the last thing, and it's, you know, the last thing is true, the first thing is true, you get the last one. Is the anyway. It's putting the cart before the horse, and it doesn't work. All right. So the statistical garbage is one thing, and, and uh, you know, police officers take that as a predictive measure, and it clearly isn't. Um, judges hear it as prosecutors, and like my young prosecutor with a .51, don't ask questions, and they just take it as, as truth, and it becomes myth. And of course, a myth no, is not as good as a mile. Um, but those myths slip easily into phony predictions of, uh, of facts in court. So where I got beat on the point two three, and in this case where I dissented, trial judges had been credulous and listened to bad evidence um, and admitted it as evidence for the trial of fact, or a trial of fact. In both cases, the opponent objected. That's how they got into court, because you got to preserve your objection. Um, and we went so far as to, realize, to recognize that it was er erroneous to admit it, but then stopped short. And, and that, along with saying it only goes to the weight versus the sufficiency of the evidence, is an appellate dodge that is um, at least lamentable. Um, the majority tied itself in a knot with this harmless error thing, pointing to other facts to show that the testimony cloaked in science was insignificant, um, but that didn't work. Um, that's the root of our self-perpetuating relationship um, with forensic science. So after Leon aced me with a point two three, um, let's see here. Oh yeah, myth is as good as a mile. Um, but again, they've seen you know we have seen so many cases that we are no longer skeptical, and we need to be. Um, 
so after I got popped on the .23, I went over to the lab and I started learning about DWI chemistry and, and toxicology. Um, and I started winning, winning cases, and, uh, and that, was, you know, that was a pretty dangerous thing. Um, you saw my bookshelf of forensic stuff there. Um, this is the DWI section. Commercial disclosure, I am, par oops, not that way. I am partially sponsored by the Wayne State Pharmacy School here today. <laughs> now you can't read it. So that is a book by a fellow by the name of Frankfurt, Princeton University Press, and it's called On Bullshit. Um, and it says that that B word basically talks about lies that are of little or no consequence, you know, they're kind of funny sort of things, to be distinguished from lies that are big and actually have consequences in people's lives. Um, you don't have to read the book, it's not much longer than what I just said. But that distinction is really, really important. Um, so anyway, I got to be pretty dangerous with DWI science. Um, the boss, my, the DA, my boss, made me the police representative on the committee that wrote the DWI test regs. Shortly thereafter, you know what he said? He said, hey, Kennedy, you understand the science grab, go help them out. I think he meant make it easier for us to get convictions, but all right. Um, when I just started defending cases in my practice, um, I once used the state's expert, and I got a directed verdict in a, one, in a .14 breath and a .18 blood case after stipulating to the tests. Why? The expert said that based on the facts that he knew, he could not testify that my client was drunk at the time he ran the stop sign and got pulled over. And in New Mexico, you had to be drunk at the time you committed the traffic offense. Very good work. Um, but I knew science, like Bill Nye. So when I became a Metro judge, I found a lot of the same mythology in play that I worked to beat in my own practice. Um, state witnesses would also get, would give a full story, but only if they got cornered, um, and only if the attorneys knew the difference um, to, to corner them in with the actual truth. When I became a judge, then I, uh, I joined the American Academy of Forensic Sciences um, in 1993, um, and a guy named Gil Saper, who we may, um, I don't know, he's not here yet. Um, hello. Ah, there we go. Um, got me uh, got me started on, on lecturing some, and uh, and I got there just as the Daubert case came out. Um, and you might remember it. It held that the former common law standard of admissibility of scientific evidence, founded on general acceptability in a relevant scientific community, often self-referential. Um, the crooks would say, all of us crooks accept that as perfectly good science. Um, was superseded by Rule 702 and the Rules of Evidence. And at least as far as science was concerned, the application of the scientific method, which is basically um, empirical, um, uh, empirical validation and objective scrutiny, um, transparency of data, peer review, standardization of reliable methods, and standardization of and validity to a point where then acceptance follows um, would be the new way to go. That was 1993, 1999, Kumho Tyre said you have to apply a similar method when you're talking to non-scientific experts. Um, Kumho Tyre was a tire failure expert, um, and you have people who are psychologists, um, e economists, um, some things that are called soft sciences, Kumho applies to them, and you have to sh see what the standardized methods of evaluating a question are for those disciplines and follow it to get the answer to see if it's a reliable answer. And judges are supposed to be able to, to make sure that this has been done before evidence is, is admitted. Um, forensic scientists started getting really nervous about this. And the reason was, um, has anybody read or think, well, how about this? Does anybody think there has been a study done on fingerprints to show that they are indeed unique between people? Anybody? Okay, now how many people believe that fingerprints are unique and can be used to identify people? Oh, come on, don't be embarrassed. Most of us, all right? Where's the validity versus what's the myth? 
Now, more and more, we're finding out the fingerprints are pretty good. You will never, yeah, I know, you're pretty relieved, aren't you? <laughs> you, you've been sitting around putting nail polish in your fingerprints for that big job over the weekend. Right? The, uh, and again, this is, this is something that points to another thing. It doesn't have to, you don't have to necessarily prove that something is perfect to have it admitted as evidence. You don't have to show that you know, fingerprints are unique, like DNA is. Uh, that's chemistry. You can show that molecules line up in ways. Not necessarily loops and whirls and bridges. But if you can show that it's good enough, that you have so many points of comparison, that within certain parameters of uncertainty, we feel really good about this, that can be evidence too. Forensic scientists don't like that. Why? The fingerprint guys have been testifying since time immemorial, being about 1898 when Sherlock Holmes said he liked fingerprints, and he did. Um, that we can do, we can match these with 100% certainty. Baloney. Hair comparison, 100% certainty. Cartridge cases to guns, 100% certainty. That's the old way. That's the old way of testifying, and that is nuts. Everything exists within some, some degree of uncertainty. And I want everybody to hold up their hand like this. All right. The, diff the distance between your elbow and the tip of your finger is known in classical literature as a cubit. All right? Now let's say you're helping Noah build his ark. You can put your hand down. And if you remember, the Bible says that Noah, God told Noah that the ark had to be so many number of cubits high and wide and whatever, right? Okay. Well, is your cubit the same as Noah's cubit? Probably not. Is my cubit the same as your cubit? Probably not. What's that boat going to look like? Maybe everybody settles down before they start cubiting and says, okay, let's take your cubit, my cubit, come up with some average, and put it on a stick. We'll cut a bunch of sticks for cubits, and everybody can use the same cubit. That is standardization of method. That's how you don't get an arc that looks weird, or a pyramid that goes off to the side. You know, in Egypt, they had gold cubits. And from the gold cubit, they made wood cubits. So everybody had a cubit. Um, but forensic science didn't always do that. Um, and uh, they didn't have very objective or empirical testing. And uh, who knows? You know, what are the odds of a random match? In other words, this hair belongs to somebody not the defendant. This DNA belongs to somebody not the defendant. Well, hairs are a lot less certain than DNA. Um, you know, enzymes in semen. That's pretty uncertain, too, and that, that's what put Calvin Johnson in prison for 17 years. All right, so Dauber was in part a, uh, a judicial reaction um, to indictments of hired gun witnesses and junk science and, uh, in civil cases um, that were talked about in books like Peter Hubert's uh, Galileo's Revenge. So uh, Dauber came out with some guidelines and... Uh, and again, started talking about let's do science the way that science is done. And let's have judges go through these steps when they are looking at evidence. Now, in a civil thing, um, most of those cases in those days were epidemiology. Um, and, um, you know, and the federal, uh, the federal courts have a, have a book, a reference manual, peer review that says what those, uh, what those subjects do and how good they are. Um, criminal courts don't have that. Um, what we got was the National Academy of Sciences report that says most of the pattern matching sciences aren't all that great. Um, what we have, you know, what we have also had, um, <laughs> anybody? Um, Watson, you'll be good enough to refrain from repeatedly interrupting me with the phrase, no shit Sherlock. Um, on the left, a book came out from the National Academy of Sciences saying that um, forensic science has real problems. 
but we don't look at those so much in criminal cases. We are still tied um, to the evidence. We see articles from here to kingdom come about bad laboratories. The young woman, you can't see her handcuffs there, um, was convicted of falsifying test results in 64,000 drug cases um, by saying that she had performed them when she hadn't. All right. Civil cases, the people get together, they have depositions, they have discovery, there's a lot of it, and things are worked out before trial. That does not happen in criminal cases so often. The prosecution and the police and the state control the evidence going in, and, uh, and generally speaking, there's not an opportunity, public defenders don't always have time, to investigate how good the evidence, uh, the evidence is. So I'm going to rush ahead just a little bit. Um, So, some questions to look at when you're looking at, at scientific evidence. Has there been research? What are the procedures and standards? And they're usually published um, to do the work that's being done to generate the expert opinion. Has the witness applied those standards? You've got a ruler. Use it. Um, and is there some margin of, margin of uncertainty that, that can be talked about? Um, I promise I talked about Dennis Jabavitti. Uh, that is Dennis. Um, and this is, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, this is a door dance, it's a social dance that was done out at the uh, Escalero Apache Reservation um, with a number of lawyers and, and, and so on. Um, so jumping ahead, I mean, I've spent an awful lot of time trying to educate lawyers and judges about how to look at science of how to think about being skeptical and saying, you know, I think this is likely going to be garbage. i got to figure out if it is or it isn't. And that takes an awful lot of work. Um, you have to find the valid theories. You've got to go sometimes far, wide, and deep um, in order to do that. Um, I have been blessed with mentors of all shapes and sizes, um, both of those Alamos National Laboratories, folks in the Academy of Forensic Sciences, George Corcoran is uh, with the pharmacy uh, department at, uh, at Wayne State. Um, and what I'm saying is that if you apply things like that method to each case you do, sooner or later you develop a habit that you can apply to any case. And I recommend that you do it. Um, judges, if we have admitted evidence once, um, no matter how bad it is, we will admit it again because we found once that it was acceptable to judges. Stare decisis is now general acceptance. And we're not scientists. But stare decisis works. And, and that's unfortunate. Because you don't know the quality of the science that the next case is using to say that last judge accepted. Um, we have to worry about that. Um, so a little advice for the baby lawyers, because I'm going to jump ahead. Number one, don't compromise with evidence that is going one way or another for your client. Um, but humility and questions will get you far in life. John Vance said, first time you go to a courthouse, walk up to the clerk and say, you know, I am a total, I just don't know anything, and will you please help me? Judge the secretary, same thing. You will, that's the greatest thing you can ever do if you're going to be hanging out in a courtroom. Um, use the tools to chase after what you dream about. Um, the greatest gift in life and path to success, as some guy I once said on Twitter, <laughs> I just found it. He was like, yeah, let's use it. Um, you know, every case you have has a human life and aspirations and, uh, you know, and a livelihood at, at stake. Um, and I want to read a, a poem, and then I'll, I'll cut it out, because judging is too human. I've dealt with people that I saw one morning they were going to come in for a commitment to alcohol treatment the next day, and they didn't make it the next day because they fell into a snowbank and froze to death up on the Apache Reservation uh, when I was a trial judge. Yeah. <laughs> the lawyer said, George won't make it in today. Um, you know, also up there, I, uh, when I was a judge for the Apaches, um, a 15-year-old was arrested for raping his sister, was put in an adult jail. He had to wait probably a month to be taken to a facility by the feds major crimes on, the, on Indian reservations to the federal court. Um, but there was a question as to whether or not he had done the bad thing 
because of disharmony caused by witchcraft. <coughs> and so I entered an order that said he will be given psychological services uh, by the tribe to, to deal with how he was uh, how he was being treated in jail and get through that, being isolated and, and so on. But I also ordered that free access to by any tribal elder or medicine man would be provided to him as well um, to take care of the spiritual question. And his grandmother um, looked at me and said, how did you know to do that? I said, well, it's something I learned back on the Navajo Reservation. All of your life is building up to every, you know, to every day and every day builds on, you know, builds up for tomorrow. Um, but it's human. So, um, you know, I've been through politics. I'm the first guy to be elected uh, or to be on the Court of Appeals in New Mexico twice. We have merit selection and then you run in a partisan election against anybody, even if they're not vetted by the merit selection. Then if you win that, then you stand for retention in yes and no elections. Um, I lost my first election, ran the second time against a guy who'd never done a trial. As a matter of fact, he said that as we were campaigning. So the second one was an easier campaign. Um, you know, I, um, the last thing I want to do is, as a judge, I, I know I'm running out of time quickly, um, is there's a lot of attacks against the judiciary these days, and I've got a bully pulpit today. I mean, we've heard it from the president who talks about so-called judges, says that a guy of Mexican heritage can't be, you know, can't be trusted as a judge. Um, but it's, it's deeper than that. Our mayoral candidates this week in, in Albuquerque were saying, uh, we will make judges accountable. Well, these are state judges and state law. How, how's the mayor of Albuquerque going to do that? Um, we have a crime problem in Albuquerque, and people are mad about it. Um, attacking judges is not the way to go. And I was told here at Toledo um, that it's the job of the bar um, to write letters to the editor explaining what the heck the truth is about the law and the judiciary and how judges operate and the constraints under that, because judges can't. We cannot get embroiled and explain what we do. Um, so I, I think you really ought to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's a small point, but criticizing judges for results that are not theirs, um, you know, a case gets dismissed because somebody wasn't ready for trial, that's not the judge's deal. He's doing his job, or she's doing her job. Um, last, um, I got to talk a little bit about um, friends and family. This is my family, my wife Phyllis, my daughters. Um, and they have put up with my being a politician for almost 30 years. They put up with my being a judge and not having very many friends because I'm not allowed to. Um, you know, all the guys I liked hanging out with and drinking beer were criminal defense attorneys, and when I started judging criminal cases, I can't hang out with them anymore. Um, you know, I coped. I started drinking at home. But, <laughs> uh, and, my wife, and my wife, to her credit, supported that as well. Um, <laughs> the last thing I would like to do, I, and I've said I've had a magical existence. Um, friends have helped me. Friends will pull you through. Have you know? Have them around, and have someone that will call bullshit on you when they when they need to. But this is a fellow by the name of Guy Clark. He was a poet. Uh, was a poet. He's from Texas, and uh, he wrote a song, and I would like to do it uh, for you because number one, I'm a bad musician. And number two, this is my speech. And number, <laughs> three, uh, and number three is it says something about. Um, the arc of a life and, and how what a blessing it is to be able to go through it. So this is my friend Don Coates. We've been friends since about ninth grade. And uh, if you will bear with me, we're going to pick up some guitars and then we'll get you back to pizza or class. Or... Yeah. And I'll walk off of the mic. And uh, and your life. All right, when's the last time you saw somebody playing music in this auditorium? <laughs> Am I the first? Wow. Okay. Um, it's called The Cape.
We're going to start slowing that fizzle out all together, right? <laughs> when I was eight years old with a flower sack, he tied all around his neck. He climbed up on the garage and figured it what the heck. Screw his courage up so tight that the whole thing come on wild. You got to run and start less hardy headed. Cause one of those toast and toast of life is just a leap of faith. Spread your arms and hold your breath and always trust your game. Swans are monogamous. It was a double blind study. But right. if the same test was sent out whether or not the DNA sample matched alleged, you know, perpetrator A, the research lab knows exactly what they're looking for. Why don't we have the equivalent level of science where people's lives are at stake as we have in whether or not swans take for life? Wait a minute, are you saying that forensic science ought to engage in blind testing? Yes. Double blind. Well, you know, the second the second the president's commission on uh, on uh, science came out with that in their study, the PCAST report last December. Mm -hmm. Jeff Sessions shut down, shut down um, the idea of forensic science report that suggested just that. 
Now he says he's bringing it back. You are absolutely right. Um, blind, you know, blind and black box testing is needed. Um, it's suggested by the National Academy's report in 2009, the PeaceCast report um, last year, and forensic science really, really resists it. Um, one of the reasons is, um, I mean, bite marks. Um, in a blind study, people couldn't even say that bite marks were bite marks. Um, with fingerprints, um, when they have given one case completed by, a, by one analyst blind to a second analyst, um, there have been problems. When you give the same case back to the original analyst blind, they were blowing it 40% of the time. And that's on fingerprints. Um, that's why they don't like the black box thing. And the other thing is, having been used to calling it 100% match, you know, confidence matches, um, they really resist having to go back and say, this isn't a 100% thing, but in my experience seeing thousands of these things, if you have this, this many fingerprints, if you have this many points of agreement, I am really confident in being able to say this is the same person. Um, but saying it within the limits of uncertainty is something the forensic guys never got, and let's, you know, you've got ethical pharmaceuticals and street pharmaceuticals. The ethical scientists and the street scientists um, have, have been disagreeing on it. It's got to come together. Anything else? Yeah? What's your opinion on the software they're using now, algorithms, to uh, determine how, whether or not a criminal may commit a crime in the future? Um, I work with a group of neuroscientists, um, and one of them, Ken Keel, has been doing functional MRIs of psychopaths for years. Um, there are certainly structural differences. Um, the structural differences can correlate um, with various traits like a lack of impulse control, those kinds of things. Um, making the jump to actual prediction, saying that a lack of impulse control is likely to result in somebody committing a crime. Um, that's been a game in Texas on the way to the death, to the death chamber for years. Uh, Park Beats, a uh, prominent psychologist, has been doing that for a long time, talking about dangerousness determinations. Um, we have a long way to go uh, before the science can catch up with that kind of prediction. Um, and the psychologists haven't done a very good job um, in being consistent. And, uh, and there's a long way before neuroscience is at a point where it can. Yeah? Uh, as an appellate court judge, uh, what do you think the standard of review should be on the liability determinations? Do you agree with Joyner, or do you think it should be a no review? Actually, it's, it's already kind of, um, kind of a hybrid. The question, uh, for instance, with scientific evidence, it's a de novo review is, is this science for Dauber to apply? And in New Mexico, for some reason, um, and I make fun of the Supreme Court, and I love me for it, um, we are not a Cumho state. We have reject, specifically rejected Cumho for non-scientific expertise. I don't know why. We use the techniques that Cumho talks about, but we don't, you know, Cumho, Cumho just didn't do it. Uh, we like Compton v. Subaru before Cumho came out, and that's when our case came in, you know, whatever. Um, but I, th I still, th I think that um, the Joyner case allows judicial admissibility uh, decisions to be reviewed for abuse of discretion. And I think generally that, that's still the place to go. But I think, that the, I think that the triggers for finding an abuse of discretion when you have an awful lot of literature and competent literature and peer-reviewed literature, um, like the National Academies report, um, the PCAST report to some extent, um, Idiot Drawer talking about cognitive bias. I mean, if these things have come up and they're ignored by a judge, that could easily start getting into a, a, an abuse of discretion standard just to knock out a, a, an admissibility decision. Does that help? Yes. Okay. But I get to say that because I'm, you know, off the bench. <laughs> My colleagues have been, oh no, they have to have discretion. No, not when they're being dummy. <laughs> And there's enough out there to show that judges operating in mythology should not be taken seriously. Um, anything else? Really? Are we out of pizza? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll catch one more. Yeah. Time. Okay. 
I think Massachusetts currently has a problem with its crime lab. Potentially 30,000 people may be absent free. Oh, hell, it's, it's 60,000 with Annie Dukin, and it's another 30,000 with the new lab they haven't even described okay. yet. So even if we have the ultimate cutting edge science, and we all agree, local edge cutting edge science, what's going to ensure the integrity of the day to day functioning of the lab? Annie Dukin went to jail for three years uh, for falsifying results. Interestingly, I mean, her lab was the one was the lab concerned in Menendez, uh, Melendez Diaz um, saying there's a right to come, there is a constitutional right to confront the analyst who analyzed your drugs and see if she did it right. In Annie Dukin's case, heck, she didn't even do it. Um, I, and it's, it's kind of funny because in Massachusetts, with the Dukin case, the Attorney General's office came out of nowhere and said, okay, we're going to review all these cases, we're going to undo convictions, we're going to do all sorts of things. In the western part um, of Massachusetts, there was another analyst who had a drug problem with stealing drugs, but was also falsifying results in, I think, somewhere around 20, 30,000 cases. And the attorney general there is fighting discovery tooth and nail and doesn't want to give an inch. Um, that, and that, I mean, that, that analyst is going to jail not only for her drug habit, but also for perjury, but eventually. Um, but I think you have to come clean, and then I have to—I think you have to have a commitment to reform the system. Um, because, yeah, I mean, for drug testing, there are methods. You know, gas chromatograph mass spec is a machine that's got an operator's manual. There are procedures for using it, which, by the way, are protected by trade secrets <laughs> in New Mexico. Um, you know, I got my copy of it just through the, you know, through the equipment manufacturer. Um, you know, how is the state going to say that, you know, that the procedure they have for analyzing, you know, analyzing drugs is a trade secret or proprietary? Um, you know, transparency is the only, you know, is the only thing that's going to make this stuff smell better. You know, that's a mixed metaphor. Transparency, light, fresh air, smell better. Anyway, but we got, we have big improvements to make. I jump around a lot. Anything else? Well, thank you. <laughs>